Good, this is working, all is working, we're all good. All right, well it's so nice to see all you smiling faces today. I just thank you for coming out on this beautiful, clear Sabbath day. Man, the rain is sure a blessing, but it's sure a blessing not to have it too, right? <laughs> a moment of respite is so enjoyable. Um, but, you know, I don't want to suck a gift horse in the mouth, as they say. I'm, I'm thankful for the rain, right? We needed it. So, praise God. Praise God. So, uh, today, I'm going to be speaking about revival and reformation. Um, I'm probably going to break this into, make it a two-parter, I believe, because I think there's just too much information to cover uh, in just one time up here. And so I'll spare you a very long sermon, and we'll probably mostly focus on revival. But um, as you probably, some of you may know, this has been a topic, I feel that the Lord has been impressing upon me for a while. I think a lot of my sermons have been along these lines uh, lately, and I'll, I'm guessing I'll continue to be speaking about these kind of things until maybe revival happens. Uh, it's one of those things that you just got to keep revisiting until it sinks in, and it's uh, my prayer that, uh, that God will touch each of our hearts starting today. In Prophets and Kings, page 626, it says, Christians should be preparing for what soon is to break upon the world as an overwhelming surprise. In this preparation, they should make by diligently studying the Word of God and striving to conform their lives to its precepts. God calls for a revival and a reformation. I mean, it's interesting that this was written, you know, what seems to be a while back now, and yet it seems so relevant today, right? I mean, we need to be preparing for what is soon to break upon the world as an overwhelming surprise. It just seems to me that something is mounting, right? Uh, you just, if you dare to even look at the news, it's like we're really standing on a precipice. And I think I, I feel like I say that every time we're here. And I feel like I'm just closer and closer to the edge looking down. And um, it's an exciting place to be. We don't need to be fearful of it. But it's an exciting place to be. And I'm excited to see this church take on the challenges that God is going to be presenting to us and the opportunities. So at this time, I want to take a moment to pray and invite the Holy Spirit into our hearts. Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord of all creation, we humbly come before you. And thank you so much for giving us the gift of your Sabbath day, where we can remember you as our Creator God. Thank you for this memorial so that we can remember who the true God of heaven is instead of the other false ideas that are promoted in this world. And I just want to invite your Holy Spirit at this moment now, Lord, to pour out upon our congregation, to touch our hearts, and to speak to us, Lord. May you mold us into your image, and may you inspire a true revival and reformation within our lives, Lord. Thank you, dear Lord. We love you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to invite you to open your Bibles with me to read Joel chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. Joel chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. Joel is in, found in the Minor Prophets. And 
this was written the time after, about the time when they were, um, well, building, rebuilding Jerusalem and the temple and the, the walls. And without further ado, Joel chapter 2, verse 12 through 17. Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn your eyes to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. And rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repent him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. But blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify the fast, call a solemn assembly. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, Gather the children and those that suck the breasts. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chambers and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thy heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? So a lot of these things, I think, pertain to us as the remnant. Joel was part of the remnant of Israel at that time. And we are now the remnant of God's people in the last time, at the end of time. And it's calling for us to repent, to have a change of heart prepare for the bridegroom who is coming and we are his bride it is soon time for us to come and share well I mean we should even now be sharing with the world the hope that we have within us but I think we are still stuck in bondage today I think we're stuck in bondage to something that we're having a hard time breaking free of. When you look at the history of Israel, it seems like there's been, you know, throughout the Bible, you see all these stories of Israel, you know, having these moments when they have freedom, and then these other moments where they're stuck in bondage by some ruling nation. And I think we could look at it, I mean, these were true events that were actually taking place, but there's also another meaning, I believe, behind it, when you, something that can be applied to us. I mean, we know that all scripture uh, is given to us um, to learn from, and it, there are examples for us. But maybe we too are in bondage like Israel was. I mean, we see as, you know, with Joseph, for instance, right? They, he went down to Egypt. He was taken as a slave into Egypt. But through God's providence, he became second in command only to Pharaoh. But then time passed on. And as he moved his family into Egypt, I think it was 420 years had passed, and, and soon the pharaohs, the then pharaohs, forgot about Joseph and what he had done for their country. And I think it's probably because the children of Israel kind of forgotten themselves what Joseph had done. I think there was 
they, well, they, were, they adopted probably the Egyptian ways. And as we look through scripture, when it refers to Egypt, usually it's referring to sin, to the things of this world that distract us from God. So they fell, they, were, they became enslaved not only by the people, by the, uh, you know, the, the Egyptians, but they were a slave to sin. They were a slave to the ways of the Egyptians. They had adopted them themselves and forgotten what God had given them as his chosen people. And it makes you wonder, you know, have we forgotten? Or do we sometimes have moments of forgetfulness of what we're chosen to do? Of what the plan that God has for us and what we're, you know, on a daily basis, are we consecrating our lives to him? Are we taking this opportunity or on a daily basis to prepare the way for his soon return? And then we see how, you know, then a deliverer was brought, right? Moses came and, and God used him to deliver the people out of Egypt. And it's interesting, you know, I don't, you know, they, they could have wandered in the desert for such a short, short time, right? It could have been 40 days and they could have made it to the promised land. But instead of choosing, you know, it's almost like God said, hey, do you want to, do you want to learn this the easy way or do you want the hard way? And like a lot of us, including myself sometimes, we have to learn by experience, sadly. Um, they chose the hard way. And so they were, you know, they were led in the desert for 40 years instead and had all sorts of issues and struggles that they dealt with. But eventually they were able to make it into the promised land. But then again, they got too comfortable in their surroundings and they were led astray by the nations around them. It's like if you remember the story of, of Balaam and, and how God used, you know, an insider basically to teach the countries around them how they could get around God, because God was blessing Israel, how he could get around them and how he could affect Israel. And it was by the use, by seducing them, basically, to seducing their young men by using their, their women to seduce them into the foreign ways, the ways of the world. And so they were persuaded and to follow after other gods in other ways because of the lust of their heart. Right, they were like seeking, like, you know, so many of us do, right? Where they saw the you know, the world and the, and, the, and the world was calling out to them. And it seems like, oh, there's so much joy in those things. But there's only joy for a short season. And it always leads to bondage again. So then we see, you know, Nebuchadnezzar comes on the scene and, and Israel is then brought into bondage yet again into Babylon, brought into Babylon. And such a sad turn of events where they had the good life, they had freedom, and they chose bondage because of their wicked ways. Because they weren't consecrating their lives to God on a daily basis. That's why it's almost sometimes better when God gives us struggles instead of blessing us. Because just like the Israelites of old, we just, we don't want the easy way, I don't think. We want the hard way. For whatever reason, it's, it's sad. I, I, I wish that weren't true. I want the easy way, right? <laughs> It'd be so much nicer. I want Jesus to come now. I don't want to have to go through those struggles. But he has to refine our characters, right? He has to mold us. He has to try us in the fire so that we could come out like pure gold. And so this, that took place with the Israelites of old. 
But then, you know, the, the uh, Babylonian rulers of the time, um, and, well, and the, the Persians, actually, I'm sorry, it was the Persian Empire afterward that, that sacked Babylon. And they seem to be much more in, turn, in tune with God. And then there was a reprieve again for the Israelites. They were allowed to go back to their homeland and to rebuild Jerusalem. And we have the story of Ezra, where he was, you know, with the then king's orders, was told to go to Jerusalem to bring funding from Persia to help build, rebuild the temple to, and to furnish it with um, you know, the gold and silver that was needed. And so Ezra goes and he becomes a bit discouraged by seeing the people that are there in Jerusalem. You know, it's like, like the, the people that grew up in the church sometimes, right? where it's just become so commonplace, the, the, the knowledge that we've been blessed with. It's, it's so easy to just, to not, uh, to take it for granted. And so he sees, you know, these people in Jerusalem and he sees that they had then again married into the surrounding nations and that they were no longer practicing the principles that they were given by God. And these principles aren't just, you know, because God is a tyrant, but he's a God of love. These are so that they would have, you know, if you keep, there's always, there's promises between be, uh, following all the commandments of God, right? There's long life if you obey your parents that is promised. You know, there's, there's health, there's happiness, there, you know, I think the Sabbath also is, you know, this day of rest. We need not only to rekindle our relationship with God, but just rest from the world is a needed thing. And so thank God that we have that. But they had forgotten those things. And so, you know, here comes Ezra and he, you know, having traveled from Babylon and Babylon to Jerusalem was quite a distance. It's interesting because Abraham many years prior had made the same traverse from Babylon to the promised land. And so Ezra and those that were with him, you know, it's amazing. They're carrying all this gold and yet they were protected by God. You know, if you imagine traveling that distance with like tons of gold with you, and, right? And, and not have some of the surrounding nations attack you but I'm sure, I'm sure that was a prayerful journey. And so I think that's when, it, you know, growth was happening, I think, even during that time with Ezra as he was making that traverse uh, from Babylon. And so he and his colleagues were strengthened in faith because they'd made that journey safely. They made that prayerful journey safely. They had communed with God. And so when they were there and they started mixing with those in Jerusalem, they actually started having an impact on those in Jerusalem that had become wayward. And so Ezra, you know, speaks to them and those that are with him speak to, to those that are with them and that, that they need to repent of their ways, that they need to give up the things of the world. And so, you know, after he makes this plea, you know, and he falls to his knees and he prays to God and just says that he's embarrassed to be part of God's chosen people and to have so easily gone astray, even though he wasn't one of the group. It was kind of like how Moses, you know, when God's anger was kindled against the Israelites, that he said, you know, Lord, you know, please have mercy on them. You know, stamp me out of your book of life, but save them. And Ezra did much the same. And I'd like to say that if that's 
not our view now for our fellow man, then we are lost as well. That we need to be willing to sacrifice our lives, to lay our lives on the altar for him. So long story short, they, they decide to make that change, to put things, the, you know, the world aside again, and they finish the work in Jerusalem, and the walls were rebuilt, the temple was restored, and all was well and good for a time. But unfortunately, as history would tell, that only lasted a short while, and then they fell into sin yet again by the surrounding nations. And then as Jesus comes in the scene, we see that now they're in bondage to Rome. So what, you know, what, what, what were the keys? Or what can we learn from the Israelites of old as they continue to fall back into bondage. They were in literal bondage, but I believe that they were in figurative bondage to sin as well, just like we are today. But I think God is calling us out of bondage to break those ties to the world, to separate ourselves. And how are we to do these things? How can we have a true revival and a reformation in our lives? Well, first we have to figure out, well, what is revival? And what is revelation? Or, I'm sorry, reformation. Are they synonymous? I mean, when we say those things, it's hard to separate them. Right? What is revival? What is reformation? When something that's dead comes back to life. That's right, that's revival. That's right, when life is breathed back in. So we see a revival and a ref reformation must both take place under the ministration of the Holy Spirit. So first and foremost, we, we need the Holy Spirit. But they are two different and distinct things. Revival, as my brother said over here, that um, revival signifies a renewal of spiritual life a quickening of the powers of the mind and heart, a resurrection from spiritual death. So I think what we first need to realize is we are spiritually dead. Right? Unless we realize that we are spiritually dead, how can we be revived? How can we ask for revival even? Because we don't really believe that in our heart. So we first and foremost need to realize that we are spiritually dead. I mean, it, it, the common saying today, when you ask people, you know, if they're saved or what have you, it's, well, I'm a good person. And I think it's past time um, that we wake up to the rea reality that we are not good people, but we are wretched, we are poor, we are blind and naked. Yes, we have been dealt a measure of the Holy Spirit so we can sometimes do good acts but people are far from good as we know from Scripture only God is good and the only way to become like him is by beholding him daily and dare I say continuously like Israel of old you can't just do it for a season. It needs to be a, a continual thing. We need to rededicate our lives on a daily basis. I know I'm beating a dead horse because every Sabbath I probably mention this, but we need, the first part of our day needs to be devoted to Him. I think that's the only way that I can get anything through to anybody or across today is that you know, those first moments of each day, if we can spend in prayer and in Bible study, that's the only way we can behold God so that we can be transformed. 
And I'm with you. There are so many distractions in this world. There's so many things. First thing you wake up, right? It's like your kids distract you or your dogs distract you or the stock market distracts you. Um, there's so many things. <laughs> Crypto distracts you, right? That's like 24 seven. Um, there are all these distractions. But I promise you that, you know, this, this verse that has become very near and dear to me because of this is that if we seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, that all these things will be added unto us. Right? He'll take care of all our needs as we just first seek after him. In the Review and Herald, March 22nd, 1887, it states, a revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. To seek this should be our first work. So we need a revival of true godliness. I know myself, you know, I want to reflect God. Is that your desire for yourselves today? Yeah. Do you want to be more like God? Coming once a week to church isn't going to make that change. <laughs> Hate to say it, it's got to happen daily. We need that manna six days a week, right? You're not getting manna today, <laughs> right? Enough to fill you for the week. And I think we depend too much on coming to Sabbath. Like, you know, I have to say I've grown when it's time to, to, for me to be up here. I'm growing not only because it's stressful to speak to people, you know, be up front, but it's, you know, how can I get the message across? It's something that we should know by now, right? Shouldn't we move on from the milk to solid food? And yet I think we still, the most basic things we need to get in touch with. And that is really the most basic thing in our walk with God is to you know, we need to sacrifice maybe our time in bed. We need to sacrifice, you know, a myriad of things. Whatever it is for you that might be keeping you from spending that time and keeping me. You know, these sermons are for myself as well. That's usually, I think, God, you know, pinpoints those things that I'm struggling with. So I'm not just preaching at you. I mean, I'm right there in the congregation with you. That this is something we need to we need. And I think it also show, it reflects in when we come, you know, for prayer meeting. I don't want to step on any toes. <laughs> I have my faithful. <laughs> I don't, but I think it, it, you know, might be good. When you, you know, making prayer meeting a priority, I think would be a good thing for this church. Because it's a good, it's, you know, there's promise there that wherever two or more are gathered in my name, there I'll be also. I, I mean, we can attest that God is there when we meet on Wednesdays. I mean, I personally feel convicted, and I talked to Brian about this, that it would be great if even we could meet in the morning, praying for our community, praying for those that are in need. I mean, last time I was up here, I told you about that, those old ladies in Veragamo, Italy, how they decided they would get together every morning and pray. I mean, they, they were willing to get up early in the morning and God used them to perform amazing miracles. Those that weren't here or maybe don't remember the story, but basically these ladies said, you know, hey, we have such a small dwindling church. Let's take this time, you know, let's, we want to make a sacrifice. We want to come together every morning and pray. So they came to their church and they prayed together. And in Italy, you know, Italy wasn't built around with cars in mind. And so they have very narrow streets. They have very little parking. So basically they were taking up the parking of the neighboring community. And one gentleman came, you know, who, you know, worked, happened to work the night shift. So he's looking for parking at six in the morning and, and was struggling to find it. And so when, he, he decided to knock on the doors, be like, what's going on? You used to only meet once a week. How come you're meeting every morning? And they told him, well, hey, we're, we're praying for the community. And he said, well, I don't really believe in organized religion, 
but I do believe in prayer. Could you please pray for me? For my wife has terminal, was diagnosed with terminal cancer and hasn't been given long to live. And they said, yes, we'd be happy to. And so they prayed with him and um, he left and they continued to pray. I'm not sure how much time went by, but they took the call that they needed to pray for the, that there was someone in their community, not in their church, that needed help, that needed their prayers. And so they purposed in their heart to do that. So they prayed for him. And then I, th it, I believe it was a short time, maybe a week, two weeks, I'm not sure. But he came back in with his wife in tow. And I, I believe for either for prayer meeting, for Sabbath, I'm not sure which, but basically said, you know, I want to join your church. And they're like, wow, what, what's the change? And he said, in essence, that, you know, we, we went after you guys prayed, we went to see the doctor and she was scanned and they said that she's completely cancer free. And this isn't, you know, this is just a few years ago. God is still, God still wants to work in those miraculous ways. But I think we're impeding him. If we, if we would just make it our purpose each day to reconnect with him, that he could use us to do amazing things. I truly believe that he has a plan for this church. I don't know what that plan is exactly, but I want to ask that each one of you would pray for that plan to be made known, that God would touch your heart, that he would tell you what he wants you specifically to do. And as a congregation, what we can do for our community or what he sees you know, how he sees our church having an impact on the world. Because I believe that great things can be done with this wonderful congregation that we have here. I mean, lately we've been seeing in the news revivals taking place. I mean, you guys probably heard about the Ashbury Revival, right? On the campus, campus of, um, of the Ashbury College. And you wonder, you know, I don't know if it was a true revival or not. But I believe that something definitely was happening. That kids, young people, and then adults were, you know, impressed that they needed to make a change in their lives. That there was something that they needed to, to make a change. And I don't know that they had the proper guidance to know exactly what they needed to do. And, you know, I don't know if they were being baptized by the Holy Spirit or not, but at least that idea, you know, was impressed upon them that they, that there was a change that needed to take place, that they need to re-consecrate their lives to God. And I'm sure with some of them, there was. So I think, like, you know, something even greater than that can take place here, a true revival. And what that, where that revival starts is again, on your knees in prayer, and why opening your word, the word of God. For it's a, if we want that dialogue, we speak to him in prayer. And yes, he sometimes speaks to us in that still small voice, but the majority of the time, he's speaking to us through his scripture. There's a movie out. We talked about this in prayer meeting called The Jesus Revolution. I don't know if any of you have heard of it or seen it. But it's a, basically, it's, it's, a, it's a, um, a historical movie talking about the 1960s and 70s, you know, the hippie era when the counterculture realized, you know, the counterculture at that time, the hippies at that time realized that, you know, the drugs and, and the things of this world were not giving them 
what they needed was not, they, they weren't having the impact that they thought. They thought they were expanding their minds, right? They, they went the worldly way first, trying to, trying to find answers. And they found that, that there weren't the proper answers being given. And they stumbled upon Christianity again. There was a gentleman named Lonnie Frisbee at that time who was a hippie himself, but had come to God. And so and he was looking for a church to partner with, to help welcome in you know, these people that were outcast at that time, right? So if you can imagine the scene, they finally find this church, uh, the pastor's Chuck Smith, and, and he had you know, a very up, somewhat uptight congregation, you know, all wearing suits, and all of a sudden, these bare, barefoot, you know, hippies come into the congregation, and there was, you can imagine, quite a juxtaposition between the two of them. Uh, there was definitely quite a difference. But I think, like we probably need to, as people from our community who are different from us coming to here, into our church, into Cambrian Park, that we need to put those things aside, right? We need to put our prejudices aside, that we need to be willing, willing to welcome people because all people are God's children, Amen. right? They may look different from us, but I think we need to embrace that even though they look different, that they, are, they still need the love of God in their lives. And so it's a great story, basically. It's a um, very inspiring story about how you know, one of these other hippies named Greg Glory kind of came around and became a great evangelist, actually. And although, you know, they were heavy on the music side of things, and, you know, I think that it's easy to get lost in, in feeling and um, sensationalism, but they were still at least getting fed this idea that Jesus loves them. That Jesus has a purpose for them. And so what this story um, really spoke to me about is, you know, as I was you know, hearing these stories of hundreds of people, you know, they wouldn't, they had too many people that were coming to God that they couldn't even use their baptismal unit. They had to go out into the ocean and they were baptizing, baptizing you know, hundreds at a time uh, in the ocean. And I just think, man, that would be so amazing. I'd love to see that here at Cambrian Park. Amen. So I think it's just, we, you know, we just need to step outside of our comfort zone. We need to make that commitment. And then I believe that something like that can take place here. But it starts with each and every individual heart. So are you welcome, are you willing to make that decision today that, to, to rekindle that relationship with God, to have, a refer, to have a revival in your life? Are you willing to make that sacrifice to spend time with the Lord on a daily basis? To start your day afresh with Him? Are you guys willing? Amen. Amen. You're willing. Thank you, Sandy. Amen. Amen. I'm willing. God willing. So I just want to read... The rest of this goes on into speaking specifics about Reformation. We'll go on to that later. But I just want to, there's a verse that, a few verses that I've been, I've been making these little index cards trying to memorize Scripture. And in Isaiah 59 two, it says, But your iniquities had separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. 
Isaiah 59 2. So it's talking about how our sins are separating from God. They're, that's why there's that, that veil between us and God because of our sins. But if we give those sins to Him, He could tear that veil down. We could have that personal relationship with Him. In Proverbs 28 13, it says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. 1 John 2.16 For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. 1 John 2.16 Lastly, 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And I guess I'll just finish with one more, with Psalms 51.10-13. It's the prayer of David. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then I will teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. That's my prayer for Cambrian Park. Amen. Amen. Let's close in prayer. Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, that you will convert each one of us, Lord, afresh today. That you that we would truly die to self and live anew that you will revive us, Lord. We so need your spirit, for we can do nothing apart from you, Lord. And we know that not by our strength, nor by our might, but by your spirit can we accomplish these great things. So please fill each one of us, Lord, and use us to prepare the way for your soon return, to make your way straight, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.